talk about sustainability in, in my world, it really is about uh, environmental sustainability. And you know, we've made a pretty good shift, at least in this project, into uh, what we consider to be community sustainability. And there is a pretty big tie in to company sustainability. And I'll talk a little about that as well. Um, Jessica did say, I am an architect, I'm not a developer. So some of the things you're hearing me talk about are developer esque, but um, we really come at it from a, a company and, and design perspective. So she told me that we've got two hours to talk. <laughs> so <laughs> we're, a, we're a 130 year old company and we're going to go year by year in the history of the show. Um, I am going to go back about 40 years um, because this, the story of Eastwood is really big. It goes back uh, about 40 years to the convention district and the uh, stretch of Markham that. 40 years ago really was uh, struggling, was kind of derelict. Our existing offices, or as of last week, our previous offices are at the corner of uh, Markham and Spring Street, right in the middle of the convention center district. In the 70s, Mr. Cromwell developed a building on the corner of Markham and Spring in an area which really was struggling and, and pretty dramatically. So you had a Robinson Auditorium, which was in a pretty sad state of repair. You had a jail not far away. County Courthouse, bail bondsmen, those sorts of things. Came off for sale, which is now the Double Tree, had just been built. Um, Mr. Cromwell was one of some partners and built the building. Um, it was the first private investment in the area. Um, and in lots of ways, I think, raised visibility of the area and spurred a lot of interest and a lot of, um, uh, drew a lot of investment to the street. He personally lobbied for a lot of investments in the area. Um, and 40 years later, we have a very vibrant that's not all Mr. Cromwell is doing. Um, however, I do believe that his um, his way of, of adding visibility and working and taking a risk in that area, building an area that had really was pretty derelict. We had two empty hotels, a third, the Cap Hotel, which was kind of pretty seedy at the time, um, and nothing else really was done in that area. Um, he leaned out there and, and decided he was going to put his money there and invest there, and the result, I think, was pretty pretty extraordinary. So, Four years later, um, you know, we, we stopped and looked at our business and we stopped and looked at the, the geography that we were in. And we realized that our work was done. Not only is our work done, but this really isn't our place anymore. This is a convention area and it's no place for architects and engineers to occupy the ground floor. So we began to really think about what do we do now? So how do we do it? Where do we do it? And how can we have the biggest impact on our community and our country? So this is what we found. Um, we found an amazing building near Heifer uh, International's headquarters. This is the old Sterling Bank building. It's the corner of um, Shell and Sixth Street. Great two-story cast in place concrete building, steel windows, concrete floors, concrete ceilings. Um, really amazing building um, that fits us perfect. And maybe more importantly, it's in a part of town which uh, despite investments from Clinton Center uh, and Half International really had um, been dragging and really needs a, a, a shot of investment and a shot of life and revitalization. So the area in blue represents the, the building, the black is actually the building, all of our property holdings along 6th Street. And the area in orange is, is our what we consider to be the area. And this is East Oak. It's bound by South Interstate 30 on the west. The north and Yuki, the airport on the east. And you know, we drew these boundaries in lots of ways on our own, mostly because within those boundaries we have everything that is needed for a really great, amazing environment and great, amazing neighborhood. Um, you've got world class institutions, which we just talked about. Um, you've got jobs, you've got schools, you've got uh, residential lots, a residential community. In fact, too, the one just south of Um, you know, we've really got a great, amazing uh, resource here and uh, we think within those boundaries. And I, I think it's important to note that the position of our building in our space is really at the heart of the problem. And, you know, to, for us as a strategist, drinking the heart of the um, community really is going to have your ability to today, so I'm going to show you that soon. So if you haven't been there, See the history as you drive through. Um, if you 
slow down and go up, there are some fantastic industrial buildings that are still in operation. The building in here on the left has been in business, Spinberg has been in business for close to 100 years in this area. Um, the top left is an old firehouse um, that has a, a really rich history that's right on 6th Street. An amazing purpose, purpose wouldn't build like this today. There's also a pretty sad neighborhood.
does have a nice gym, about 25,000 square feet of office space, that's where we get the gym. Um, we have a restaurant in the building that we go to see my cat that's diner. It's a, a partner and the two local um, uh, food, food people, Kelly Marks and Don Janelle. Uh, she opened in Mason. We have uh, something I'm probably most proud of, we have a community room. The space is not too long like this. And um, it seats about 100, and it's in this really big corner. And the idea with that room really is to um, engage people in conversations just like this, um, to exchange ideas, to bring people to the neighborhood, um, to give a place for neighborhood associations to meet. It's outside of a, a dumpy community center somewhere. It gives them access to state-of-the-art AV, gives them catering kitchen capabilities, breakout conference spaces. <coughs> We've already got looking for a group that teaches autistic kids um, ways to think outside of their mainstream um, existence. Those things we want to attract to the community and to the area. Some for our benefit, but mostly for the benefit of the uh, neighborhood and the community. The other part of building community uh, here in our building is about apartments. And we've got 16 of those here on the site. And those are mostly one bedrooms. They're real cool, funky, um, industrial feeling. We have three two bedrooms. I think we have, at this point, we have 10 left in that are not used. Uh, the first tenant will be moving in in a couple of weeks. Um, the residential part really is about building community, not just on our side, but really is about, you know, uh, broadening um, the, the time in which people are here um, in the neighborhood, uh, offering different living opportunities. has been a, a, a regular bit of business and kept the neighborhood for a long time. So here's some of our, our space and pictures of our space. Um, you know, one of the, the things that, that we realized about our space that we've been in for 40 years is it's just an old office space. And not only is it an old office space, it's very corporate. And it was great 40 years ago when people wore ties to work, they wore ties to drafting tables, they smoked and they had drinks and conference rooms and board meetings and you know, that's not what, what we are today. It's not what our success is today. And it's definitely not what our community is today. And so a big part of, of doing this beyond sustaining and creating uh, some vibrancy in the community, we wanted to do that for our own company community. And so we created an awful lot of space in the building just by open collaboration. It's not about take down work. It's really about working space. And it's providing a working experience, a working environment that is attractive to younger people. I'm in my mid-40s, and this is great to me, you know, it's fantastic, but I'm more worried about the 20s and the 30s. I mean, we've been in business 130 years, and we're a legacy company, and when I leave, I want to have another round of leaders coming in behind me, and this is the way to attract them, and to make sure that there's a vibrant working um, experience for them that isn't just sitting in a cubicle or in the interest of, you know, having their heads down and go home and think about things they want to do. Jock either, you'll see we still have a little bit of work to do in the landscape. Um, but uh, I think you can see the, the life that it's built in the building. So this was an early vision for Shout Street. This is looking more up towards Heifer. And you know, I think we'll get there. I think that, you know, with the restaurant there on the right, um, when it's a peak view, that'll be a cannabis diner. Um, we're doing a lot of streetscaping, a lot of long street parking. And it really is intended to emulate a downtown street. Love it or hate it, it is a struggle, but it can be 
a very positive uh, piece of what makes a neighborhood vibrant and part of the fabric of the city. And you see how that was actually done. This is near the other kettle over there in the top in the corner. Um, maybe the same guy that did that, did that. Okay. And, you know, so we want to contribute to the community and do something that, that we'll know is important to honor the community. So we got a guy that actually paints with spray paint. And he knows what he's doing, yeah, I know. Um, but he's a community worker. And this is here to stay. This is a mural that really is called Men of Iron. And it's there to honor uh, the people in the community. And that, to me, that really is what art, public art, thinking about the place, thinking about the history, and it is all about spray paint. We have looked um, at a couple of other areas. Uh, you know, if you go anywhere you know, at any city that you know, there's a warehouse district. Uh, there's some great ones, there's some great examples. Um, I can't say that we researched either one of these um, in any great detail, but gathered inspiration from form, and quality, and ideas. We are our So what's next? There's a lot happening in this village. Um, there's a marina under construction. John Burkle crews uh, stepped out pretty significantly um, to build a marina. He's got some residential that's uh, following pretty close. So this is uh, really by the residential neighborhood that is east of our project. Uh, what's significant about this is he's committed to building apartments all along the riverfront. And that's going to be the first residential construction Stem is scheduled to open in July. Uh, this is huge for us. They announced actually two days before we did that we were just going to announce that. They, they stole our thunder a little bit, but um, we're happy to have them as neighbors. Uh, mostly because it's 1,200 homes that are going to pass by our doors twice a day. Um, and that's going to attract a lot of retailers, a lot of food service retailers. We're going to have kids in the neighborhood. We need an opportunity, another. Um, opportunity uh, for kids in the neighborhood to hang a bill in these little houses as well. So my job, and you guys saw the, the latest, and I think it's kind of talked about in the article. This is a building that's um, just about a block away from our headquarters that's going to be uh, turned into an outdoor beer garden. This is a Fish and Gavin Park, it's downtown partnership, hosted there last year. And it's going to have a brick and mortar location for Count Portia, which is a Amazing barbecue we haven't had it. Um, they, they're a great region park. We live there and they have a truck and move there. So we're excited about that. That really proves out that retailers and food service folks are really um, willing to follow us and that we are really truly inspiring our folks to, to follow and be part of what we're doing now. This building is an apartment building. It's slated for construction, but very soon um, there is right behind Rebel Kettle at the corner of Collins and Capitol Avenue. thing to say, okay, great, we're just continuing to build the building, so what, right? Um, you know, the reality is we, we do this, some for ourselves for great working space, but mostly for what we can do in the community. So, um, you know, we focus on our building primarily, but it is working in the residential areas, and, um, you know, how can we uh, begin to raise property values and really do some good in that neighborhood, doing our Day. We painted six houses um, and uh, uh, I think really did, did the community do. A big part of what we can do is actually plan out some redevelopment. Um, you know, the, the area has suffered from, I think, a lot of speculation, uh, planning speculation, especially in the areas behind Clinton Library and Heifer and this red zone here. Um, that's resulted in the weed loss and the lack of housing and displacement of people. And you know, my biggest fear is that that will attract investors and developers and 
builders and there won't be a plan, there won't be a strategy. And we've seen that happen in other parts of our city and I, I can't say it's been disastrous, but it hasn't been as good as it could be. Um, you know, so our next push is to work with stakeholders in our community to develop a plan and a strategy and hopefully craft something that is responsible and appropriate and also considers the fact that the people that live there have probably lived there for several So, you know, we've had a lot of success um, here in Little Rock. Um, a lot of great communities here, a lot of great neighborhoods. Um, it's a fascinating place to work and, and development business. Um, it's very interesting. You know, there's six of these areas highlighted, and, and you all probably know them well. Um, you know, in East Village, it's, it's just another one. Really, you know, we're starting to think about it. And we've got some of them. We've got uh, the Freight Corridor, which everyone just knows about, by the way. Uh, River Market. Six there in the, the um, west side of our, our um, community, <coughs> it's just green for some reason. I mean, it's, it is the next area. We all know it. I mean, all these folks out here. It's really screaming for something to happen in this area. Um, so we have had a lot of success. It's, um, what's fascinating, Bob and I were talking about this before I started, um, what's fascinating is how slowly these things have gone. You know, River Market was 20 years. Convention District, you could say it was 40 years. It's probably not fair. 20 to 25 years. Soma has been pretty quick, I think it all things considered. Um, it became something pretty quick. Uh, Argenta, same, although it's had some sort of ups and downs and some start of some interest with them. But um, you know, compare that speed at which we do things here to our neighbors around the state, it's really kind of a little embarrassing, frankly. Um, and that's a different situation. You think about what's happening in Northwest Arkansas. What's happening in Jonesboro? Things in Jonesboro go and you check that out. Um, even in Congress, you know, and they're doing it quick, they're doing it fast. Now, these are available that in some of those places that we just don't have, or we do have and not really deployed um, for whatever reason. Um, you know, but these, these places are about creating quality of life for their people and attracting talent. to be part of something in this community. Um, we, uh, I don't think we have any illusions that we're fixing our community or, or fixing the neighborhood. We are committed to investing in a part of our community that really needs it. And it's been slow decline and steep over the years. Um, we really do feel like we're going to be a significant part of that array of neighborhoods that you saw. And a significant part of improving the quality of life in our community. Um, being part of our Sustainability. It's not just East Village, but that is Little Rock, North Little Rock, Central Arkansas, and even the state. You know, we want to attract talent. We want to attract people with careers, and and you know, for our own companies, but also for, for our people. And this is my home, and I want a great place to go hang out and go you know, eat and drink and go see live music. I want kids to come back and visit us in our neighborhood. Um, you know, so.
so we, we really feel like um, uh, we're, we are doing something, albeit relatively small, for our community. But I, I guess I would, would leave us with a little bit of a challenge that we need to figure out what it is that we can all rally around and not have pockets of this great revitalization that's happening. Um, you know, what, what can we do to instigate community revitalization, citywide? Central Arkansas wide, regional wide, um, that we can really just stand on it, that we need to, if we're not doing it now, our community will carry us the same direction that we need to start doing it. Questions? Thoughts? Hey, when, uh, so you talk about the, the slow pace of, of change. Uh, I, I grew up in North Little Rock and I left for a decade and a half. And before I left, I swore to God and never ever moved back here. Um, you know, when I was growing up, you just didn't come to this part of town, day or night. Uh, same thing in North Little Rock. You didn't come to the downtown part of town. I'm third generation in North Little Rock, so you know I have. You know, my family just kind of migrated out over time. Uh, but I kind of wonder if the some of the slow nature might be overcome at this point because people are timid and they wanted to see if it would work or not because that's all they knew was that people left and that's a bad part of town and don't ever go there. Um, we're just, you know, moving out and there's, I mean, there's the, the, you had a huge flight from north of the river to Cabot and south of the river to Benton Bryant. You know, is it something now that you think is proven so that people will want to invest more quickly in it uh, and, and, and catch up with that pace that you say that the younger folks desire? Yeah.
the Clinton Center and Western International both being platinum certified three buildings. And you're saying that there's going to be like 1,200 cars a day passing by East End. What are y'all doing to, is that a priority for y'all? To yeah. actual sustainability. Actual so sustainability. And, you know, cars are dangerous for pedestrians. You know, we're dealing with that in Selma right now. You know, trying to go on the road by it. So I'm curious what y'all have planned. So from a, a green building perspective, our target for our space is several things that I think are kind of cool. Um, we have a small green roof. That's not quite sure how it works with, with recent pollution that works in this town in Arkansas. We have solar skylights, I'm not sure if it's your building, but they're actually solar panels that bring in light as well, also for the first time in Arkansas. Um, we have a pretty uh, significant um, recycling program.
this is. This is actually on a bike trail. And we have, uh, we've signed it, marked, marked in the street, the bike trail that goes through there. Um, the restaurateur here, Donnie, is a huge biker. And he wants to actually do something inside and outside of the restaurant that will attract the, the bicycles or the high-end bikes. Um, there's a pallet scale actually inside of it. It's a, it's a little pallet scale. He wants to actually make it a landing station for a bicycle. You can actually get in geared up, put your bike on it, and actually weigh yourself up in your bikes. Um, we do believe in some form of So Mike had brought up um, Austin, which I grew up there, and now when I go back, it breaks my heart. Um, it's been really great for some people, 
But in building what they have now in Austin, they I feel like they've stripped away a lot of the character. Um, and so how, how do, can you keep Austin weird when you, you know, bulldoze this little bottle shack that had like, the, it was this crazy thing. And now it's, you know, you know a very authentic unit. So, um, and all over, so, um, I would love for you to, John, what you, as far as what you've done to honor the area. Um, and I want to say, I heard you talk about how the name East Village came about and kind of how that furthered keeping the community there and honoring what's already there. Sure. So, you know, the, the second and third slide I showed is, is really cool with Nancy Bowles and Thomas Warner. And in the history of the place, if you want to know, it was, it was the first industrial park in Little Rock. So the railroad came in to Little Rock, and so you had all these things grow up around the railroad. And, you know, to me, those buildings are beautiful. And more importantly, not everyone agrees with me, but more importantly, that's our history. It's our heritage. And, you know, I, I don't want to lose the industrial that's there. And I don't want to kill those buildings that are in there. But, you know, Aptos Steel is there. They've been there almost 100 years. There has been around 100 years. And so they're staples of that neighborhood, staples in that community. And from a, a functional perspective, yeah, they're ugly buildings in lots of ways and ugly operations, but they're their jobs and they're people. And when I put a food truck out here, they're going to flock to it because they work there and they need services and they want food and they want experiences. You know, so our, our job now, we're just one property owner in the village, but you know, hopefully our job is to knit a lot of that vision together and help respect the old fire station. Things like that, to us, are going to make that a cool, funky, pretty, vibrant community that's a rich, unique experience. And you go to all these neighborhoods that have been successful, Argento and Selma in particular, they, they've done that. They've kept these great old buildings, weird or not, they've kept them. Um, and I think they're the richest experiences and richest neighborhoods we have around the community. To your other question on East Village, so um, this was our, our first real effort at building consensus. Big neighborhood meeting. We actually met several times, well, we met once, but several times with anyone who wanted to go. It was an open meeting that focused primarily on the property owner in the village area. And our big charge was what are we going to call this thing? What are we going to call this? We, we talk about our cars, we call it every day, but it doesn't mean much. Let's, let's brand this thing. Um, and so we put about 20 names up on the board, and East Village was not my pick. that was it was healthy for these people in the community and in the neighborhood to know that they were part of that and to be part of that experience and you know to have a say so and not just you know a bunch of guys coming in throwing money around and building a building and, and saying this is the way it's going to be and, and I, I hope that that was the start of the spirit of you know of listening to the neighborhood and listening to the community and, and making decisions. 
Thank you so much, Dan.